Drum roll, please. By Lisa Jen Bigello. Chapter 2. We towed our luggage across the lot to the growing mob of campers and their families. Sprinkled in our camp rockaway stuff wearing black t-shirts and holding clipboards. A woman with wispy blonde hair, glasses and a sunburned nose made her way over. Hi, welcome to Camp Rockaway, she said. I'm Poppy. Let me get your names and we can figure out where you're headed. Olivia Mendoza, Olivia said. What do you know? Poppy said, making a check mark on her cardboard. You'll be playing up in Treble Cliff with me, she turned to me. What about you? Melissa Goodwin, Olivia said, before I had even processed the question. Looks like you were in Treble Cliff too. Welcome, Melissa. Wait, I see a note here that you go by a nickname. Poppy pushed up her glasses and squinted at the page. Sorry, Damon, our director has terrible handwriting. I thought about telling her, yes, I did have a nickname, Lissa. Lissa sounded so much more sophisticated than Melly, name for a rock star, not a mouse. Then Olivia said, she's Melly, and that little fantasy fizzled out. Oh well, it's not like I would have had the guts to say something anyway. Melly, Olivia, terrific. You two can put your stuff over by that post. The ranger will drive it into the campsite. Hold on to any personal instruments until after your audition. My stomach twisted. This was the first time I'd heard anything about an audition. Poppy saw my panic. Oh, don't be scared. We call it an audition, but it's more of an interview. It's our way of learning a little bit about you. No one's judging you. No one gets sent home for not being good enough. Okay? She pulled out some maps from under her clipboard and make, began making circles and X's. We're here. The practice cabins are where the auditions take place. Afterward, you can take your instruments to the lot. We've got lockers here. We've got lockers there. Finally, here's Trouble Cliff. It looks a bit of like a hike, I know, but it's gorgeous up there. The best campsite at Camp Rockaway. She grinned as she handed the maps to Olivia and me. See you up there. We found the post for Trouble Cliff, one in a line of eight. There was one for Base Cliff, too, of course, and for Carol Kingdom and Buddy Hollow. Each name was punnier than the last. Olivia and I rolled our eyes as Mom chuckled. I felt a pang. I wish Dad had been the one to drive us. Nobody appreciated a good or bad, depending on how you looked at it. Pun like Dad. We piled our things. Pillows balanced on top of sleeping bags on top of suitcases to keep them out of the dust. Mom snatched my map. This way to the practice cabins, she said, and started walking. My feet stuck to the ground. Um, Mom, I don't think you're supposed to go with us. What do you mean, Melly? Of course I'm supposed to go with you. She waved the map towards the trail. Look at all these parents going with their kids. Olivia and I exchanged a glance, as if to say, should you tell her or should I? Olivia gave a polite cough. Only the little kids, she said. Oh, good grief. But she looked around and saw what we'd seen. All the other kids our age were already hugging their parents goodbye. SUVs and minivans were backing out of their spaces to make room for the next round of arrivals. <laughs> Mom sighed. Are you sure, Melly? I wasn't. Not really. Once mom left, Olivia and my sticks would be the only familiar things I could hold on to. But I couldn't show up to my audition with my mother in tow. I had enough to worry about without the other campers thinking I was a scared little mama's girl. I'm sure, I said. We'll be fine. You can go. Yes, we'll be fine, Olivia said. I promise we won't get lost. I'm an, ex I'm an excellent navigator. She reached for the map, and for a second, I thought Mom was going to let go. Wasn't going to let go. Her grip tightened, rumbling the paper's edge. Suddenly, it slipped from her fingers. 
Mom looked sad and I wondered if she was thinking about driving home to an empty house. Well, that was her fault, hers and dad's. I refused to feel sorry for her. Fine, I'll go. Mom said, but not but only because you two can't start camp in a state of humiliation. I can't have that on my conscience. She drew me into a soft hug. I stood stiffly at first, but then instinct kicked in and I sank into her soft embrace. Use loads of sunscreen, she said into my neck. Your fair skin burns so much easily. Okay, mom. Eat your fruits and vegetables. Don't stay up all night talking. Okay, mom. And write, please. I put some stationery in the pocket of your suitcase and some envelopes, already stamped. If you want to write to your father, I'll make sure he gets it. I know he'd love to hear from you too. This time, I didn't answer. I didn't want to make a promise. I wasn't sure I could keep. Unfortunately, Unfor Olivia chose that moment to say, I need a hug too, Mrs. Goodwin. Mom squeezed. Mom released me and held out her arms to Olivia. Come here and give me a squeeze. Their embrace was so uncomplicated. Nothing was changing between the two of them. Suddenly, I m wondered if the divorce meant Mom would change her name. It was sort of old-fashioned that she'd changed it to match Dad's in the first place. But she'd been Mrs. Goodwin all my life. Was she going to be Mrs. Skiff from now on? And what would happen to my name now that Dad was moving out? Would I stay Melly Goodwin or would I become Melly Skiff? Would I even have any say in that matter? One more hug and I, and I swear I'll go, Mom said. She hugged me so hard I was pretty sure there'd be finger marks on my ribs. Have fun, she said. Don't worry about Dad and me. Just think about yourself and I'll see you in two weeks, sunshine. I love you. I think I, she was waiting for me to say I love you back, but I didn't. Finally, she let go, kissed me on the cheek, and turned towards the parking lot. Wait! I called out. She turned back eagerly, but all I said was, Pet Mackie is waiting for me. Pet Mackie for me. Mom smiled, but it looked pasted on. I will. I will give... I'll give him loads of extra playing with his feather toy. Then she disappeared into the crowd. Olivia and I watched her go. Olivia said, Well, I guess camp's officially begun. I guess so, I said, and pasted on my own smile. We walked along a shady trail that must have been packed down by thousands of campers. After a while, it spilled into a green grassy clearing with six small windowless cabins arranged in a hexagon. Muffled music escaped and blurred into the open air. Campers lined up outside. As we joined them, one of the doors opened and a boy carrying a guitar case came out. Looking happy, a counselor stuck his head out and called for the next camper. Why does that cabin say Plymouth on the door? Olivia said it as it shut again. I don't know, I said. Why does that one say Gibraltar? Plymouth is the rock where the pilgrims landed, right? Olivia frowned. What do pilgrims have to do with anything? Who knows, I said. Gibraltar's somewhere in Europe. There's a big rock there. Oh, Olivia got the joke at the same time I did. She rolled her eyes. Plymouth Rock. Rock of Gilbrader. Somebody thinks they're hilarious. I read the signs on the other doors. Uluru, Zuma, Guatape, and Trolltunga. Presumably, there were other famous rocks around the world. Dad would be so bummed to have missed this. I'd have to tell him. Assuming I ever felt like speaking to him again. What do you want to bet Trolltunga means troll tongue? Olivia said, Can I bet you're probably, li probably right? The door to Uluru opened and a counselor beckoned to Olivia. Wish me luck, she said. Luck, I said, as if she needed it. Me, on the other hand. It's not like I was a terrible drummer. 
I wasn't amazing, but considering I'd learned most of what I knew from online videos, I thought I did okay. But there was a huge difference between playing alone in my basement or even with Olivia and performing for a complete stranger. It didn't matter that Poppy had promised it wasn't a test. My hands felt like wilted lettuce. Next! A voice called sharply. A tall, thin woman with olive skin and jagged black hair was waiting for me at the door to one of the cabins, Troll Tunga. Of course, I got the cabin named after a piece of troll anatomy. It seemed like a bad omen. I hesitated and the kid in line behind me poked me into the shoulder blades, between the shoulder blades. I stumbled forward. The counselor closed the door behind me. I'm Donna. Have a seat. When I moved towards the folding chair by the door, she added with a smirk at the drums. You are a drummer, aren't you? I guess the stick bag gave me away. Embarrassed, I obeyed. I'll try to make this as painless as possible. Donna said, name? Just like Poppy, she had a clipboard and a pen. Unlike Poppy's blue beak, Donna's pen was decorated with skulls. Melly, Melissa Goodwin. How long have you been playing? I counted back in my head. Almost three years. I mean, that's when I started bad at school. But I just played bass drum at first. And then in sixth grade, I mostly played snare. I didn't get my drum set until Donna waved her hand like she was shooing a fly. I wondered why she'd asked the question if she didn't want to hear my answer. What kind of music do you like to play? What are your favorite bands? Um, uh, anything. I said, I mean, usually other people choose. I just play along. Okay, but what would you choose if you were the leader of the band? I squirmed. Leader of the band? That would never happen. Even when I played alone, I used songs from playlists Olivia put together. I don't know, I told Donna. I guess I just like ma making noise. It sounded silly, but it was true. It all started in the fall of fifth grade when Olivia dragged me to Mrs. Estrada's instrument petting zoo. Mrs. Estrada mostly taught middle school band, but she came, up, came to our school two afternoons a week to teach the fifth graders. The petting zoo was how she'd recu recruited new members. From flute to French horn, from tuba to tom-toms, she laid out every instrument around the music room for us to touch. If it didn't involve saliva, we could even play it. How about you on trumpet, me on trombone, Olivia said, or me on oboe, you on clarinet? I hadn't told her I had no intention of joining band. My DNA wasn't, didn't include a single musical gene. I could barely creak out, happy birthday. I etched my way ar around the room, letting the other kids wrestle over the tenor, tenor, sax, which was quickly established as the coolest instrument, and the mellophone, metallophone, which sounded good without even trying. Somehow, I ended up alone with the bass drum. It hulked in the very back of the room, looking, like, lo looking less like a musical instrument than an uncomfortable piece of furniture. Maybe that's why it had been overlooked. Its wooden body must have gleamed once, but now it was scratched and scuffed. Its skins were dappled grey from being struck countless times. It was no tenor sax. It's stupid, but I remember thinking. No one is watching. I can hit this drum and no one will know it was me. My fingers curled along the mallet, a stick topped with rabbit tail fluff. I lifted it high and swung it as hard as I could. As it made contact, vibration sizzled up my arm and rattled my th teeth. The drum released a waga 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 so loud and deep I felt it in my stomach. Of course, everyone immediately turned to stare. Mrs. Estrada's fingers were in her eyes. I hated people looking at me, but I couldn't help it. I got a wild smile on my face. The drum had sung louder and truer than I ever could myself. I was dazed. I was dazzled. I wrote my name in capital letters under percussion on the sign-up sheet. Olivia was even more excited. I'll sign up to play guitar. We can start our own band. Oh, I said. My stomach feeling weird for some reason. I thought you were picking oboe or trombone. 
Is guitar even an option? It will be, Olivia said breezily. I'll work it out with Mrs. Estrada. But since when did you have a guitar? She shrugged. My birthday's next month and my grandfather told me to think about what I want. Well, I've decided I want a guitar. It's okay with you, right? Sure, I said. Starting a band would be awesome, I guess. I just hadn't thought that far ahead. The truth was, I hadn't thought past playing the bass drum again. Olivia hugged me. We're going to be rock stars someday, Melly. You see, you wait and see. And I guess I caught her excitement, but suddenly I felt all right again. Still, you can't play rock when your entire musical career consists of whacking a bass drum, no matter how good your time or tone is. It took me a couple of years of school band to convince my parents drums weren't just a phase. And Olivia did more than her share of wheedling in the meantime. But one day they surprised me with an old drum they set they'd bought on Craigslist. Who cared that the black queener was covered with stickers from 80s hair bands? It was mine. I could make the house shake. We'd ride our bikes to the house after school. Olivia's guitar strapped to her back. Sometimes our friends joined us. Todd on his electric, Stella on vocals and synths. But mostly it was just the two of us, playing hour after hour. Everything from the Rolling Stones to Tegan and Sarah. Whatever Olivia had scrounged up. This past year, she added bass to her repertoire. We don't need two electric players. What we do need is a rhythm section. A rhythm section, bass and drums, holding down the beat, keeping the band on track, together. And now we're at Camp Rockaway. Tell you what, Donna said, and maybe it was paranoia, but I thought I heard her give a little sigh. I'm going to play something on guitar. She leaned over and grabbed an acoustic from where it was propped against the wall. And you jump in and play along, okay? I pulled a pair of sticks from my bag. As Donna began to strum in, strum in 4-4 four, four time, a song that could have been any song, I joined with a simple rock beat. My foot worked worked the bass drum pedal on one and three my hand my left hand answered on the snare drum with rim shots on two and four my right arm stretched across the body to the hi hat tap 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 keep going my playing was so stiff i sounded like a robot i forced myself to play a little louder as if increasing the volume would pump up the energy I sort it sort of worked, but my hands still shook. I reached up for my cymbals, hoping a good solid crash would cover my nerves. Give me a fill. Hesitantly, I rolled my sticks along t- across the tomes from high to low, back and back again. When I played back home, all of me, my body, my mind, my heart belonged to the music. The music filled me to the brim. There was no room for anything else. But here, playing for a scowling stranger with a skull pen and clipboard. It was so full of hurry, there was hardly any room for the music. My sticks caught on the drum heads, ruining the rhythm. Only my foot on the brace, bass drum pedal was steady. But thinking about my foot was a mistake. I f- it fumbled. I tried to find the beat again, but I lost it. I bit my lip. The only way this moment could be worse was if I started to cry. You can stop, Donna said, scribbling on the clipboard. I've got what I need. I sat frozen. Could that really be it? I tried to read Donna's face, but she didn't look up. I stood up and walked past her to the door. Outside trolled Tunga. Olivia grabbed me. How did it go, Melly? Easy peasy, right? I can't wait for... Wait until tomorrow, when we actually get to play in a band. They should have auditioned us together, so they'd know what kind of rhythm section they're really getting. I tried to match her enthusiasm, but my stomach nodded. If everyone made the cut at Camp Rockaway, why did I feel like such a failure?